Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at ATA. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over with our moderator who joins us from Jones Day, Jennifer Everett. Thanks, Eddie, and thank you everyone uh, for joining us this afternoon um, for uh, this very interesting and timely discussion on how cybersecurity enables customer-centered care. My name is Jennifer Ebert. I'm a partner at the law firm of Jones Day uh, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, in our cybersecurity privacy and data protection practice. Uh, it is my pleasure to serve as your moderator for this afternoon's session. We are joined today by an esteemed panel of cybersecurity experts from various sectors and hospitals and uh, technology suppliers and consultants. And before we get started to do sort of a, a deeper dive for the next hour uh, in terms of uh, you know, discussing this topic, we wanted to give an opportunity to you know, obviously introduce our esteemed panelists, Carl Connolly, Chris Logan, and Ophir Loden. Um, and then we can dump, uh, do a, a, a jump right into a discussion really on the spread and increase of particularly the telehealth uh, sector and digital health technologies and really the cybersecurity risks uh, and other considerations that uh, organizations uh, should consider. So with that, Paul, let me turn it over to you if you can, if you want to just introduce yourself to our audience. Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, my name is Paul Connolly. I'm the uh, Chief Security Officer for, at HCA Healthcare based in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, HCA Healthcare is, is one of the largest providers in, in the country uh, with 185 hospitals and about 1,500 other sites of care. Um, I've been here about 19 years now. Thanks, Paul, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Chris, would you like to, uh, Chris Logan is with us as well from VMware. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for having me. Uh, Chris Logan, I am a, um, the Director of Healthcare Industry Strategy for VMware. I'm also a Healthcare Executive Advisor for VMware and our Global Information or Industries Group. Um, you know, my team at VMware, we really try to be a trusted advisor to our customers, not only to the people that we're selling our products and services to, but also to VMware proper to make sure that VMware understands the language and the idiosyncrasies related to how healthcare is trying to improve patient outcomes. Prior to my time at VMware, I was also a chief information security and chief technology officer for two different health systems for over a decade. All right, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Ophir Loden, would you like to introduce yourself who's joining us from Title Care as well? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, so my name is Ophir Lotan. I'm the head of product and customer success at Title Care. Uh, we're in the field of virtual health, uh, a pretty innovative solution providing a, a, a full, a, like face-to-face -face experience just remotely uh, for anyone doing uh, remote care. I've been in the telehealth industry and in general in digital health for over 20 years, doing many different things, medical imaging and uh, HIEs and other things, selling enterprise technologies. But this is actually the most exciting time for me, uh, selling technology that touches the consumer. Nice to, uh, nice to be on this panel. Great, Ophir. Thank you so much for joining. And for those that are listening here, and just as we mentioned earlier in the call, uh, you know, this is intended to be an organic discussion. Uh, we'll have questions and answers from the panelists, but feel free to raise your hand, um, offer any questions that you have into the Q&A panel, uh, and we'll try to get to those either between the uh, presentation day or afterwards. So don't be shy and, and go ahead and participate uh, where you, uh, you know, where you may have a question or comment. So Paul, why don't we go ahead and get started? I mean, I think inevitably in terms of at least Every part of our conversation these days, um, whether you're talking with someone you know familiar or with a with a with a, a stranger in the grocery store, the conversation inevitably goes back to the pandemic that we're in or coming out of. Uh, and certainly, the outbreak of COVID-19 is was continues to be a, a crisis that we're dealing with uh, and has become sort of a not only a, a, a national but an international concern. From your perspective, can you tell us sort of what trends or changes you've seen in sort of the use of telehealth to provide access to healthcare services in light of the COVID-19 pandemic? 
In other words, how has telehealth changed or evolved from the world pre-COVID to the world that we're in now? Well, I think it's been significant and, and you know, maybe it'll prove to be one of the silver linings of, of the pandemic is, is the, in the way it's affected telehealth. Um, my organization was progressing down the telehealth path already pre-COVID, but the impacts of the pandemic definitely created a huge push forward in, in order to meet our patients where they needed us to, to meet them. Um, you know, our, our company mission says above all else, we're committed to the care and improvement of human life. And at a time when uh, our, many of our hospitals were dealing with huge numbers of COVID patients, there are many cases where the, the way to meet that mission was through telehealth. So um, I'm hopeful uh, that will be the, the silver lining, as I mentioned, or one of them. Um, so, so we have rapidly, over the course of the last 15 months, 14 months, we've rapidly expanded our service offerings and technical capabilities. Um, you know, just for example, our telehealth volume in 2019 was two, 219,000 patient mm -hmm. encounters. And in 2020, it was 1.23 million, a 462% wow. increase in volume. Um, at, at our high point, we were able to care for 10,000 patients per day through telehealth. So um, it definitely, was a difference maker through the pandemic. And um, we've seen the pace continue in 2021. Uh, it looks like it's largely here to stay. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And certainly, the, it's a, a prolific and expansive chance and their expansion of, uh, of telehealth services. And, you know, Chris, perhaps, you know, from as a director of healthcare industry strategy, you, you and your job have helped empower health organizations to you know, develop effective and secure digital healthcare solutions. And recently I was, you know, I noticed that you'd wrote an article actually on the evolution of technical, you know, uh, digital health technologies. And, and you there you wrote that, you know, digital healthcare is, is here to stay. And perhaps just by virtue of, of Paul and the statistics that he just wrote to be perhaps is onto something here. From your perspective, you know, how has COVID-19, you know, driven changes in the healthcare and in telehealth and, and you know, it, what do you see sort of going forward? Yeah, it's, I like to age it to uh, the cat's kind of out of the bag and you're not going to put the cat away now. Um, it just is what it is. And I think what we've seen as we've gone through this, this evolution with our customers and even prior to COVID, you know, telehealth was a part of our operating mantra. So when I was working on the other side of the desk as a healthcare chief technology officer, it was part of how we were providing the best care humanly possible at a fraction of the cost, right? We were trying to get more money back in for the reimbursement, keep more share of the wallet. Now, when COVID strikes and we've gone very digital already, it's just going to become a part of everyday life. Um, and there's going to be certain products that are going to be delivered, certain service lines that it's going to make sense to continue to move forward with. And what we've seen was people ran out of the gate to get to how do I reach my patient? right, when the pandemic first started. So organizations like Paul's, who was already exploring telehealth and had a good chunk of visits to start at, at, a, at a, in a process that was just beginning, got to elevate that and execute that very quickly. A lot of smaller organizations came to us and go, I don't know what to do at this point. Um, but they already had the foundation for what they needed to be successful there. And I don't think it was the technology as, as the inhibitor for getting reach out to those patients. It was a culture of the organization, changing how clinicians work with those patients to reach, the, reach them where they are in their care journey. So we see this as just the, the tip of the spear. We mm. see a lot of movement forward. We see a lot of opportunity for improved patient care and patient outcomes, really driving that last mile for patient care that we've been talking about for so long also in parts of the world, parts of the country where it's just underutilized, right? So really looking at digital health and telehealth as being the opportunity now to take care of populations. You know, we've talked about it for many, many years, but now is the time for us to really get down to brass tacks and actually do it and do it in a way that's engaging to that end user, that consumer, the client who wants that prime optimal healthcare outcome. No, so, yeah, Chris, that's a very good point. And you mentioned, you know, there's sort of a cultural shift with how healthcare sort of provides the services. I think on the other hand, also, there's also, and you've mentioned this as well, uh, also sort of the consumer demand, right? I mean, this is sort of, I think, driven it by virtue of us being sort of remote um, in, uh, and, and having to do things sort of remotely. 
And Ophir, I think, uh, you know, Title Care is an on health telehealth provider and, and your, you know, where your platform is understand is, is de designed to bring all aspects of the doctor's visits to the home. And as a personal note, you know, I've gotten so used to using as a consumer telehealth services myself. Uh, yesterday, we had to actually go to the doctors for the very first time because my youngest daughter had, uh, you know, had a fracture in her wrist. And it took me a moment to realize, oh, I can't do this on the phone anymore or with the patient portal, right? We actually have to go in because unless if you're, you're telling me something about your services that I don't know, we cannot yet remotely put casts on risks, but I, I bet that's the new world to come. So from your perspective, as we move beyond these traditional limits of in-person services, you know, our, you know, changes, you know, how are you seeing sort of, in, you know, the services you're providing that, you know, how has COVID-19 sort of expanded the services that your organization has provided and Really, how are users or patients impacting those changes in terms of the healthcare services? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so first, a little bit about title care, since we're in the thick of it, like like uh, everyone else on this panel, but more on the technology enablement side. So, you know, we came up with a unique technology and solution, which is consumer oriented, uh, to essentially take telehealth to the next level by closely emulating the face-to-face -face medical visit but remotely at the home, wherever it is, the, that last mile, you know, whether it's a remote clinic, it could be a prison, it could be a cruise ship, it could be a consumer's home. Uh, and some of the secret sauce of what we're doing is we're enabling uh, consumers or lay users uh, to essentially perform that complex action of a medical visit or a medical exam at the home using uh, intuitive guidance and navigation technology that's built into our product uh, for both synchronous and asynchronous telehealth. So both of those types of avenues are important to different care models. Now, uh, related, uh, we, we are also fully integrated into the ecosystem and I guess I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, but in terms of COVID-19, uh, from my, our perspective, it took telehealth light years forward. So telehealth was up and coming. Everyone was thinking about it. Everyone had innovation departments looking into it. Uh, but essentially COVID-19 brought it into the mainstream and created that education moment for everyone to understand uh, what is telehealth and the power of it. And now that there is such an understanding, consumers and users are demanding uh, these types of digital health solutions and they want to be empowered uh, by doing some of these, uh, uh, you know, doing some of these uh, actions remotely uh, to benefit from high quality services, to do things from the convenience of their home. You know, so like like you, you don't have to go, you know, into a clinic and have someone sneezing on you or whatever, um, and you know, and and do all of this in a very cost effective, very efficient, uh, which is uh, telehealth. Um, now, as, as this uh, trend is happening in force, the healthcare entities are essentially, and uh, you know, everyone across the board, you know, healthcare providers, small organizations are realizing that virtual services need to be a core part of their offering and day-to-day -day operations. And this is mainly being driven by this demand uh, by consumers. Thanks, Sophia. And I think you've actually touched on this, which is gonna be leading to my next question is, you know, as we move really to a post-pandemic environment, I mean, if digital healthcare services are here to stay, what do we think this is going to look like? And particularly, it sounds like Ophir, you kind of touched on this, not to put you on the, you know, uh, in the limelight here, but it sounds, I mean, we're going to be moving to even smaller healthcare organizations, smaller networks being able to provide, or at least the expectation from consumers is that telehealth will continue to be an extension or an arm of the services. Is, is this where we see the world kind of moving to and evolving? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so you know, obviously, obviously during the pandemic peak, there was uh, the pandemic peak itself. There was a peak in the activity of telehealth, and that kind of leveled off a little bit. But it's now growing steadily at a very, very large uh, growth rate. Uh, so, obviously, the people who have tried these services and were, uh, uh, you know, uh, had a taste of them, are essentially continuing to consume them, and that's why there is going to be sustained demand. Uh, for these types of remote services. And actually it's still very early in my opinion to realize the full extent of the change, but the direction is very, very clear. 
Yeah, and I'm going to hop in real fast, Jennifer, uh, with this one, because I think what we saw took place was uh, we got to stay in touch with our our patients, right? At the end of the day, we have to make sure that we're at least screening them, trying to get preventative medicine into them to ensure that they're staying healthy so that they don't get admitted to a hospital or readmitted after the fact. So that baseline, that foundation is going to grow. I'm a firm believer in the fact that we're going to be monitoring patients remotely for a whole bunch of different diagnostics in the future, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's going to be a driver or a changer that now we're going to have to start looking at telehealth a little bit differently and get more consumer with it. So, you know, I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of clinicians. They're like, you know, can we really trust the data that comes out of that Apple watch? You know, I, I'm not 100% sure just yet. I think we have to do a little bit more work there, but it is going to be a part of the fabric of how that consumer wants their healthcare being delivered. And it should be an entry data point to understand how they're feeling, how they're doing. There's so much opportunity with consumer technology now in the patient's home or in that place where they're being visited or seeing for care that we need to start looking at that as that next level of care delivery to really drive better quality outcomes. And and obviously again, you'll hear me say this a thousand times, reach people that we've never reached before. I think that's the most exciting aspect of telemedicine is getting it to places where we've never had the opportunity to have that impact on a community. It's uh, it's really gonna be driving the fact of providing equity across the board for how we're delivering healthcare to communities. Yeah, Chris, and that's, that's a great, that's a great, I think that turn point to, and, and Paul, I'm question to you as well is, you know, inevitably when we're talking about telehealth, but right, we're talking about, well, patient data overall, right? We're talking about confidential information. We're talking about protected health information. And, and whether we're, we're thinking about, you know, a, a, a large enterprise, we're collecting, you know, a wide mass of information in the hospital, even for smaller organizations, and providing for customer demand for telehealth, we are at the same time needing to sort of balance that against sort of the cybersecurity risks that, you know, are inevitable or the privacy risks that need that organizations of all sizes will need to address uh, and tackle. Um, and um, I don't think... Uh, it's going to be, you know, a surprise or news to anyone either listening or certainly to our panelists that uh, the risks of cybersecurity uh, threats from threat actors, uh, whether for monetary gain or for other concerns, right, are uh, are just, um, you know, at their highest peak, um, and will continue to provide, you know, off will be more sophisticated in their attacks. So, how can an organization, uh, a small organization in particular, that may not have sufficient internal resources to tackle privacy or cybersecurity challenges, what do you do when you're a smaller organization or what, what, how can you plan for this post-pandemic expansion of telehealth and telehealth, you know, digital services? And Chris or Paul, I opened that question up to either of you guys and for your thoughts on that or, or any of the panelists. Sure. Well, I'll be glad to start. I, I do think, as, as you said, Jennifer, uh, there, there's kind of a perfect storm in healthcare where there's a critical need for the services, especially during a pandemic, high value targets, and in some cases, vulnerable points of attack. So that's why we've had this, this storm of, of cyber attacks against healthcare. But I, I really don't feel like it's you know time to wave the red flag and say we can't do anything about this. And I, I see a lot of work where the community is banding together so that large organizations like mine can provide information that helps smaller organizations. And you know, when it, when it comes to something like privacy and, and cybersecurity, I feel like everybody's on the same team and, and we all want to help one another. So um, it's, it's hard for me to comment being on a really in a really big organization, but, but what I would suggest is that smaller organizations look at how do they collaborate with others and share resources and, and gain information um, from, from those that do have the, the resources available to them. Yeah, and in that, that same vein, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity out there for smaller organizations who may not have that same level of agility or the skill set or the resources, right? The relaxation of the Stark anti-kickback rules gave some, some flexibility to how larger healthcare organizations can support smaller healthcare organizations, right? I think there was a huge opportunity here and it's brought a community together where organizations are now having more dialogue about cyber, right? Because we all know that we're in this fight together, regardless of the size of your organization. We're all in this together at the end of the day. 
So being able to fight the fight is going to take all of us to step up and really do our parts. And that's not just the healthcare providers. That's organizations like mine, right? So as we're developing technologies, we have to look at it from the lens of how do we simplify operations? How do I get you greater visibility? How can I enable you to do more with less while protecting your risk landscape or your, your, your risk that you're accepting in the threat landscape that's out there. So I think we're starting to see much more of that shift of organizations talking to one another, sharing information. It's much more open and fluid now. Um, and you know, there's gonna be a lot more opportunities in the future to build these communities. And, and you know, the one thing I, I stress about this most often is that in many situations like this, we ran to digital, right? And I'm guilty of this too. When the American Recovery Reinvestment Act came out, we already had electronic medical records, but we ran to, to bolt on as much as we could. Security was an afterthought. I want people to take a pause for a hot minute and get back to the basics, right? So the normal blocking and tackling with information security and cybersecurity will go a long way. That doesn't take a lot of technology, a lot of investment, it takes a lot of manpower, and it takes cultural shift and transformation within your organization to know that it's not just Paul's responsibility for cybersecurity or privacy or compliance. It's everybody's, right? So really getting everybody on board with that mindset, and they all row the boat in the same direction, and we get back to basics, it makes life a little bit easier. Now, the threats that are out there are pretty decent. There's a lot of organized gangs and criminal organizations that are going for it as we've seen just recently in the eastern half of the united states right uh, we're going to have to continue to fight this fight but like paul said we're not just going to put the flag up and wave and say we gave up no because the outcome that we need to provide is a service that's detrimental to life and death at the end of the day so i think the banding together and making sure that we're all rowing the boat in the same direction will pay some very significant dividends both on the reliance of the bigger providers and the vendors in the space, the trusted partners that are trying to provide the best services we can to our customers. Of course, that, that's, that's very helpful and, and, and fully agree. And, and you know, and, and Paul's are open this question for you. I mean, even from a, you know, from a large organization like HCA, I mean, and the, perhaps this question is too large in of itself, but I mean, how do you prevent sort of risk-related errors? And I think Chris may have sort of touched on one that's inevitable, right? You I mean, you may have, you know, you know, endpoint units, you have, you have sophistications in terms of, you know, the, the type of threat tech, you know, threat actors that are coming out there, but inevitably in the end, you know, you know, we also have human error, right? Where phishing attacks, for example, are uh, up, you know, by I think last six, 700% uh, and threat actors becoming even just more sophisticated in that respect. Um, and we are human, right? I mean, what steps can you take, I mean, what have you thought through in terms of as from HCA and sort of uh, you know, uh, managing risk sort of the post pandemic or during the pandemic uh, in light of sort of the telehealth, particularly an increase with the telehealth expansion. Well, I'm, I'm going to steal some of what Chris just said. I, I mean, I, I really think that the, the way we've tried to approach it is it does take the whole community. I mean, we, we tell people that no matter what your job is, you've got a deputy security officer badge in your wallet. Um, so we focus a lot of our attention on making our colleagues aware of the threats and what risks we face so that, and, and really emphasize the point that you've got to take ownership of your part of it. And um, as, as Chris said, we have raised the bar with our vendors. We have much greater expectations for them. Uh, we, we really try to make the point that this is a shared responsibility and we've got to work together if we're, if we're going to address this risk. And, um, you know, the, so the way we think about it is make risk visible, encourage good decision making, and then at the end of the day, make sure that people take ownership of their decisions. So it's, it's awareness, it's reporting, it's using metrics, you know, anything we can do that sort of help people understand their stake in this. And, Going back to Chris one more time, he also made the point that it's it's not just up to the privacy team or the cybersecurity team. Everybody has got to take ownership. And you know, the good news on that front is I think the events of the past year, especially, I mean, everybody understands what is at stake here. And the collaboration and commitment has, has never been greater from my experience. Yeah. Just to sort of follow up on what you just said here, you know, I was um, you know you know, you mentioned earlier, right, I mean, you've been doing this 19 years, you, you're, you're responsible for the protection cybersecurity, you've got 185 hospitals, you've got, you know, a quarter million employees, you've got 35 some odd million, you know, patient care that you're responsible for that, you know, that's not, 
doesn't make for a, uh, I'm sure, relaxing Wednesday or any day of the week. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was listening to, you did a, a presentation about a year ago, and you made a very interesting point about when, you know, when you were working uh, for NSA, um, you know, cybersecurity and enhancements and whether offensive or defensive, it was understood, right, in terms of it's obviously it's a fundamental part of the agency, right, cybersecurity, preparedness, posture, uh, all of that. But then when you moved outside of NSA, whether at a you know, White House or the private organization, people ask the fundamental question of why. Why do we do this, right? Or why do we have to do it? And if you can't get that buy-in, people aren't going to do it. I, I, I know this from outside counsel's perspective as well. The why is important. So from your perspective, you know, what, you know, how do you effectively communicate risk mitigation you know, outside of, and I agree that this is a, you know, this isn't a CISO issue, right? But how do you effectively uh, communicate risk mitigation to your other stakeholders, whether it's employees or feel free to real free reach into, you know, consumers, the patients, employees, they, you know, what are some effective ways that you, you know, um, to pass along, you know, uh, the risk uh, and, and so that it really becomes a, a team um, effort here, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think what you just said, I, I, people really want to understand why. And if you can explain that in a way that they understand and they can connect the dots to their part of it or what they're trying to accomplish, it really helps uh, get that sort of approach where everybody takes ownership and it's sort of baked in from the beginning. And, and that's really the way we've tried to do it. Um, you know, just making the point Sometimes you have to tell scary stories and, and point out the bad things that can happen so people understand what's, what's truly at stake. And in healthcare, obviously, you've got people's lives at stake. So, you know, the, the ultimate uh, possible negative outcome. So um, the good news is that that gets a lot of attention. And a lot of it, it to me is in all how you deliver the message. I mean, you, you can't be, you're not a police force, you're, you're a collaborator, you're a partner. And if you're working with, you know, for example, our, our telehealth group, um, you know, they've got goals, they've got opportunities that they see how we can really improve how we do business. So it's really important for us to, to show them that we're here, we're your ally. We want to make you successful in finding new and better ways to take care of our patients. And when you've got that kind of teamwork going, uh, that to me is, is the best possible way of, of um, reducing risk. And, and then you've got to you know, have sort of the administrative side of it, the assessments and the reporting and letting people see the actual numbers and the metrics so that they, they realize that this is a real uh, real risk that we've got to address. Yeah, and a scalable one that they can manage, right, within their yeah. own. Yeah. Exactly. So, go ahead, can Chris. I hop in on this one real fast? I love yes, this. Yes, absolutely. I love this topic because it is a monumental task to get people to understand their responsibility, especially in healthcare. Because think, think about the culture that the organization has right now. Have you ever met a nurse or a clinician or anybody in care that says no? Right. So now you've got to change that mindset from a no mindset to maybe a maybe mindset and throwing technology into this mix only made it that much tougher because now they're balancing the needs of that patient that's in the bed or that patient that's on the screen with the technology here. You know, one of the paths that we always took when it came time for education, awareness and understanding was we tried to make it as personal as humanly possible. We know that they're there to help. Right. But how do you make it personal? Well, we, we put in antidotes in our programs to say, listen, we know from home you're using technology on a breakneck pace, right? Maybe you're using TurboTax, maybe you're doing some online banking, maybe doing some other stuff. Can we give you the tools to create better cyber hygiene for your personal life, your personal experience, and have that bleed into our corporate environment, right? It's a very interesting and delicate dance. I know it is. I, I've seen it and I, I commiserate with Paul because he's living it on a day-to-day -day basis. But at the end of the day, the more personal we made it to create that understanding, the more success that we saw in showing those metrics in the long run that makes it a much more informed user at the end of the day. Yeah, Chris, and your comments are always so timely. And I think I'll fear the spring's opportunity to bring you back into the, the comments comments here. But you know, Chris has sort of touched exactly right on is that. There, there is a balance, right, between, you know, particularly from the consumer side, right, or the patient side, where you run to see sort of the convenience where, right, that's the that's the buy-in. And it's also, you know, we'll touch on a comment that's come in from the, the audience as well, but we do want the convenience. We do want to be able to, 
you know, do online scheduling, do the patient portals, provide the services, right? In terms of whether it's, you know, COVID testing or whatever the case is uh, from our home and to be safe to do it. At the same time, we almost need as inpatients or employees, whatever our role is, protection from ourselves um, and, uh, and our own habits, right? So what about, you know, from your perspective, from a provider side, you know, you provide variety of health organizations from telehealth companies, retailers, and, you know, self-insured employers, private practices, you provide services to a wide range of, you know, organizations. How do you, you know, your organization help to mitigate risk to consumers when providing, you know, your digital health solutions? Yeah, yeah, sure. So actually a nice anecdote is, you know, telehealth in the first days used to be telephone based, you know, uh, some of the bigger companies are called Teladoc and others, uh, but, uh, you know, phone based uh, visits actually have a, a large risk uh, in them, you know, because essentially they are susceptible to social engineering techniques much more than, you know, uh, digital visits, which are usually fully authenticated, you know, on both sides. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so, so from that type of risk or perspective. So, you know, actually we are moving forward and some of the techniques that we're implementing with, uh, you know, these new digital means are actually lowering the risk in some cases. But in any case, an organization like Tidal, uh, we implement a robust security program as a part of our company, which has four pillars of data security, which are, you know, the, the important pillars that need to be addressed. One is confidentiality. So making sure the data is always stored and not available for foreign access uh, via strong encryption, both on the fly or at rest. You know, so that's one aspect. The second one is data integrity. So the data is not damaged or changed and this mitigates ransomware attacks. And there is of, of course also a robust backup program which is always in place and disaster recovery. And then the availability is the third important aspect. Um, so utilizing high availability platforms such as uh, AWS or other tools in the cloud with multi-region support, 24 seven services, automated SLAs and then the fourth piece, which is the most important one actually for health, uh, relevant to healthcare, of course, is privacy. Uh, and, you know, conforming to HIPAA, to CCPA in California, uh, standing by ad additional standards as needed for user consent, you know, as they're moving through these types of services. So all of these types of mechanisms need to be in place for a vendor such as ours to make uh, the experience secure. We also implement strong authentication capabilities, uh, whether multi-factor or when authenticated from other uh, platforms with technologies like OAuth, SAML. Um, so, you know, all of these play things together and make the experience and the user feel that they're getting a secure experience as a part of the service. Jennifer, I think you, you've also kind of nicely addressed a question that we've gotten from the audience, right? Where you're seeing, for example, wherever you may be calling from, um, you know, some resistance to the sort of the move to telehealth, whether from the, you know, the provider side would have you. Uh, you've sort of touched on where, you know, uh, companies or organizations are able to successfully uh, provide telehealth services, as Paul has mentioned, right? Seeing the significant increase in the movement to telehealth. And then from your perspective, building in, um, you know, the technical and security measures uh, to help keep the data the secure that is a part of the exchange. Um, are there any other arguments that we should, you know, for example, if they're seeing some resistance, perhaps whether from the doctors, providers providing telehealth, um, whether because it may reduce autonomy or um, the, you know, other sort of issues that raise that, you know, may be sort of a proponent for considering telehealth in the expansion, other than the fact that at least here it's become inevitable, right? Just because of the, because of the inertia of, in the pandemic. Yeah, pr provider, providers are key to a successful virtual service and they, they need to be on board. They need to feel that there is an efficient and secure telehealth service available with high availability and, and, and high quality of service. And of course, when telehealth was in its infancy, there was a lot of doubt about the use, about the efficiency, and many providers preferred in person, the in-person approach, but this is not the case any longer. I mean, providers are embracing telehealth. There are many advantages uh, and, and there are some challenges related to that. And it's not only security, it's related to many other things like 
cross state licensure for uh, different providers and uh, working with multiple platforms and different ecosystems that need to work together as one. Latency and quality issues on the remote infrastructure side, uh, synchronized quality of care across a network of remote providers who are not always in the same place or in the same area. Or for instance, marrying the in-person visits with the virtual visits. So the hybrid approach as they call it in many places, which kind of is like the holy grail of, uh, of, uh, of telehealth. So some of these challenges obviously are addressed by legislature. Some of them are addressed via tight integration methods between the different platforms, which we're doing also. Some of the, some of the features that the telehealth vendors are providing as a part of the platform are optimizing the virtual care experience, both for the provider side, but also for the consumer side. And, and allowing some virtual, uh, versatile virtual care uh, platform workflows. So all of these together address some of the challenges. Thanks, Sophia. Yeah, and have you seen, or Chris, have you seen this you know, sort of, maybe I think even it sounds like perhaps it's more diminishing here in the US than before, but any sort of resistance from healthcare providers to opening up to, maybe on a small organization to opening up to expansion of telehealth services where there is an additional buy-in? Are we, are we seeing sort of those sort of reluctancy to open up in this respect? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to frame this response in the, the form of the digital divide, right? And why am I saying this? And I'm going to use, I'm going to use this specifically for the providers and the consumers, right? I'm going to do two sides of the coin here. Um, from the provider side, you know, I'll go back to when we adopted electronic medical records. We saw a big push of providers get out of the profession because the Perfect example, my primary care doc, I went in one day and his physician's IPA, the group that he was supporting came and put a computer in his office. He said, I'm done being your primary care doc, Chris, because I refuse to document electronically. I think it's going to ruin our relationship that we have as a provider and a patient. You know, I, I was in the business in healthcare at the time I said, no, it's not. It's going to create better quality because now we can simplify all these damn tests you keep sending me for repeatedly, right? It's going to cut the cost for me and you're going to get good results. Um, he didn't buy it. He got out of the profession. It was just time for him to go anyways. But you're seeing, we saw a lot of pushback from those clinicians who were getting on in age, right? Had been practicing a certain way for many, many years. And now we were, we were turning over their apple cart at the end of the day, just to give an example. But here's the digital divide issue is that now you have clinicians that are coming out of college and have a certain expectation for how they want to conduct their work. And are we providing them with the technology that they've grown up with to satisfy those needs? I mean, I have a 25 year old son. He expects that when he onboarded in his new company as an engineer, everything was going to be electronic. He was uh, sadly mistaken when they didn't have all those processes in place, right? Because he came out of the womb with a smartphone. He was just accustomed to using that on a day-to-day -day basis. That's how he lives his life. So think about those clinicians that are coming out of med school right now, going into their residency programs, right? They all grew up with the technology. They didn't grow up with the Atari 2600. They grew up with the Sony PlayStation, right? They want something better. Are we providing it to them? So you saw the move for the clinicians that are just like, I don't want this. And then the clinicians are like, yes, this is exactly how I want to practice medicine because I'm used to this. I'm comfortable with this. Now take it to the other side of the coin, to the consumer and talking about the digital divide. We talk about how connected we are. And I think here's some of the pushback from the question that came in from the gentleman from Brazil is that, not everybody that they're providing services to have access to those services. They don't have strong broadband in certain areas. We're victim to this as well in our own country in the United States is that we built this great infrastructure on copper wires. Well, it doesn't really span. It's not as agile as everybody thought it was going to be. We can't reach everybody with this technology because of latency issues and jitter and availability, right? So you have those that live in communities that have complete access, live their lives that way, have this expectation. Then you have those that we have to figure out how to reach because they just don't have the same connectivity as everybody else. That's going to be an issue to go on for a while. I don't think 5G is going to solve that right away and be the, the grand savior. It's going to do parts, bits and pieces. That's going to bring in its own cyber issues also at the same time. The more we connect people, the more threat landscape there is. So I think we just have to look at the digital divide and balance it equally on both sides so that we're meeting the needs, not of those who have it and those who don't, 
or those that want to use it and those that don't. So it's just going to be over the next few years, understanding how we move this into market to be successful, to provide a better service to our patients. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great comment there. And, and, and you know, it's sort of a follow-up question from, from the audience here is, you know, maybe Paul touching on what we were talking about earlier, you and Chris, and, and you know, having the knowledgeable cybersecurity team and the awareness of the current threats or trends. Now, are there other sort of mitigating factors that in particular we should be looking at now? Um, audiences ask, you know, for example, with a hardware device perspective or proprietary data with IO-based cloud technology vulnerabilities, you know, you know, where where should be, you know, the mitigating factors? Where's the focus? From my perspective, it's all of the above, but, you know, welcome your, your thoughts here. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I would say the same thing. You know, to me, it, it seems like at its foundation, there's a cycle that you have to go through, understand what you have, what are the threats against it, where is it potentially vulnerable, and, you know, what steps can you take to mitigate that risk, and where does that fit in on your priority list in terms of, of risk go? So regardless of whether it's it's 5G or it's an IoT device or another type of medical device or a, a Windows server, you, you, it's just got to be part of the way that you operate is, is sort of the way I look at it. it it's kind of like if you remember um, in, from psychology class, Maslow's hierarchy, where you had to take care of the foundational things before you could move up to the, you know, the higher, more exotic things. I, I feel like that's the foundational level. Uh, you've got to just make sure that you're doing those steps. Yeah, Paul, I feel like you've probably, I don't know if you're talking about the technology or about my own diet program. I'm still working on the foundation to be able to keep up with my, <laughs> to move beyond. <laughs> but Ophir, I don't know if you have any other thoughts yourself, right? As you're sort of developing, expanding, and providing new technologies and new sophistications in your products and services, what are you seeing and what are you thinking about in terms of mitigation, particularly from the consumer pers perspective or securing the data that you're collecting and, and sharing. Yeah, yeah. So, so we are always looking at how we are actually, we have a device, also a physical medical device uh, at the home and also an app and we have the, the cloud, you know, so we're always looking at how that data is secure all along the way, you know, of that cycle. And we're dealing not only with, uh, you know, with the EHR, sometimes it's user entered data many times, but we're talking about clinical data that our system collects. So it's much, much uh, deeper, you know, in terms of the security risk and the PHI. Um, so we usually, you know, we secure all of the different endpoints, you know, whether it's a hardware, whether it's, a, whether it's the app, no data is stored there, you know, uh, long-term. Everything when, as I mentioned before, when it's stored at rest, it's encrypted with very strong encryption uh, you know, uh, uh, government level encryption and also on the fly to the cloud. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, usually, uh, uh, in, we're doing all, we're using all the means possible now on the cloud level, there are different security measures there because that, that could be susceptible to hijack attacks and other attacks. So, you know, you have application level firewalls, multiple VPCs. We use only HIPAA compliant services, uh, in the AWS cloud. Uh, you know, so doing all of those right things, you know, quote unquote, from a security perspective, also in your infrastructure. And just to hop in right here, because I have to, I love hopping <laughs> in. Um, I, I'm going to say something that's going to be very controversial, right? I work for a software company. Nothing's secure by default. Let me say it again. Nothing is secure by default. Um, to address the question that came in, yes, all those areas are areas where you should be focused on. But as a business, you have to understand your risk. What are the risks you're willing to accept? And then tailor your program to meet those risks, right? Remove the risks that you're not willing to accept. The things that are in the gray area, you continue to watch them, right? You have to have continuous visibility on the risks that you're willing to accept. But just know that you're not going to get a device and you're not going to plug it in and it's just supposed to work the way it's supposed to. There's going to be something that's missing that doesn't meet your risk profile. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't satisfy somebody else's risk profile because risk is different for every business. And depending on how you're going to market, how you're, what service lines you're bringing forward. I mean, I could go on for days, right? But it, by, by default, it's just not secure. So you're going to have to take some time to understand it. It goes back to the conversation that we were having earlier about security being everybody's responsibility from the CIO 
to the CEO, all the way down to the janitor and everybody in between, even to the consumers that are coming into your organization, changing that culture to be secure by default and thinking about what their role and responsibility is. You raise a good question and one we often are advising clients on whether we're, you know, we're on the provider side or advising clients in that respect or here on the healthcare side as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, thinking about in particular the platforms that you are leveraging, uh, the services, the cloud solutions, you know, is, risk is not really inherent only to our sort of our own systems, but really that of sort of the third parties we're working with and the fourth parties and the fifth parties and the flow down. So what can we tell our listeners about third party risk management, right, with our vendors and, and, and the visibility down to the fifth, you know, third, fourth and fifth, and how can you manage that, right? Yeah, I'll defer this one to Paul because I know he has a program. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, 10 years ago, this was like the bane of my existence, uh, trying to get uh, third parties to, to be on board with uh, what we were trying to do from a security program. But fortunately, it has come miles and miles, and, and we're in a much better place today. But um, it, it's, it's got to be part of making the whole system work. I mean, the third parties provide the tools, and in many cases, they may be actually handling the data or even hosting the whole system. So we've it's got to be almost like seamless between the third party, the vendors that we're working with and our security. And, and it's all got to work together as a shared responsibility. So, you know, quite candidly, if, if we're uh, meeting with looking at a new vendor and they push back on that topic or, or don't appear to be informed about it, it's like we don't even want to do business with them these days. The risk is just too great. So, so we start with you know the upfront vetting of the the, the, the third party security program, their history, um, and then we it's part of contracting. We have a very specific information security agreement, as as Chris's company knows. That's part of our contract. Uh, we do technical assessments of their product or the services that they provide. We establish terms for ongoing support. And then there's even very specific areas like how do we handle access? How do we handle incident response? You know, how quickly are you going to notify us if something happens on your side? How quickly will we notify you if something happens on our side? There's, it's, you know, this, this sort of collaborative approach requires that kind of detailed connection between the two sides. Absolutely. And, and I, I think what, you know, we also see also the audits, right? The, the preliminary due diligence, you know, of the, the vetting of your vendor and the audits, the ability to do the audit rights at various integrals, whether it's your annual or as a result of a security incident. And I, I know, fear this is probably one of the questions or from the, you know, third party risk management that not only you're managing with for the organizations from your providing the services, but also part of your flow down to any sub processors or other vendors that you're using as well. Um, and so I think, uh, Paul, you've mentioned it, right? I mean, this isn't everything, we don't do everything on-prem, right? Not everything is a part of our own solutions. It really is an integrated understanding what security or obligations that your organization is actually responsible for in connection with or in collaboration with the third party. But Ophir, I don't know if you have any other thoughts or comments to add to that. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I know obviously you're dealing with no. your no, no, no end. Problem. And then also with respect to the entities and the vendors that you're using as well. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a new world. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, no one wanted to do cloud. You know, everyone was on-prem, right? So now uh, everyone is open to the cloud. And obviously this uh, has more risk. You know, you, uh, you need to manage those uh, vendors that you're working with. So, you know, when a company comes in, like Tidal, for instance, comes in to do business with a help system, uh, we bring in a string of other companies and technologies that we're using along the way, right? Like uh, AW, you know, Amazon Web Services or other cloud services. And you need to be covered, you know, uh, all the way down and all the way up, you know. Uh, so, you know, there are different ways of doing that, such as the BAA uh, agreement, you know, with all of the different vendors as you go downstream, uh, which is critical, you know, no, no, no. Uh, no uh, company uh, would work with us, you know, handling healthcare data without having that type of coverage, for instance. Uh, other ways is the security programs that I mentioned, of course. And, you know, there is a high security group of employees, for instance, that are, uh, have access to this type of PHI data. And there are different rules and, and uh, uh, audits related to that, those types of employees. 
So we have different measures, you know, to uh, to uh, uh, to deal with those types of uh, realities. Great, and I think this may be a good time for us in the last couple of minutes to think about. I think each of the panelists have touched on this. The two sides of the coin, right? We're focused on the cybersecurity, but without, I think we can't go without mentioning sort of the the privacy side of the coin, right? Where you're looking at sort of two sides of 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 data data maintaining and 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 data collection and and so you know Chris I guess as you know uh, and I think many of our you know audience you know the OCR has proposed some notice of proposed rulemaking in December outlining some changes to HIPAA's privacy rule and particularly I mean there's a wide range of proposals but one thing I think is probably really salient to this conversation is with respect to access to data um, or access to a patient sort of PHI in a pretty limited turnaround time period. Um, how are these proposed changes, I guess in your mind, gonna have sort of impact services or provision services to, to patients? Yeah, I, I love these types of questions because proposed rulemaking is never final rulemaking. It'll change along the way. We thought price transparency was gonna live we saw what happened with that. Um, so I think this is a good thing. Um, but again, I, I struggle with this one because I look at it from the consumer's eyes and the consumer's perspective, right? It's, it's their data. Make no bones about it. It's their data. We're just stewards of it when we're consolidating, storing, and using that data. So they should have access to it. But I look at it from the lens of the other side of the coin is that Think about privacy in general and how much do people share online, right? So you can go onto people's social media accounts and find out everything under the sun. There's no real expectation of privacy there or we've foregone it because this is a great service, but we want privacy in someplace else. So it's just a weird balancing act, right? We have to give it to them. We have to give it to them. There's no doubt about it. I think it'll make opportunities available for organizations to further extend their service lines as well, because I use that as we're turning healthcare into much more of a consumer sport. You should be concerned about your data, how your data is being used. You should have the right to choose to sell your data if you want to. That's my own personal opinion. That's nobody else's opinion. That's my personal opinion, right? So I think it's good that we're going down this road and having some tough conversations right now because the way the landscape's moving and being shaped, I think we'll get there. I think, again, though, hesitation when I talk about privacy is that in healthcare in general, we don't have a solid identifier for, for patients, right? We mix and match data quite frequently. So it gets real... I get nervous when we start to talk about privacy and certain expectations just because we don't have the best way to identify who a person could be across the many different systems that they're going to. And that can create a lot of downstream issues and confusion. And I hate to say it, liability on the end of the provider because you're gonna bear that brunt at the end of the day that patient has a certain expectation. So again, a lot of different paths I just took there, but in general, I think it's, it's a good thing at the end of the day. No, this, I, I think, I mean, access controls, we're sort of seeing an evolution for privacy, whether just general state law with respect to PHI, but I mean, this is only right now, I think we've been focusing on, you know, the conversation from sort of a U.S. point, although of course cybersecurity standards, we're not treating data from, or where we're providing it data from both U.S. versus U.S., that's certainly true. But, you know, if you're, I think, you know, if you're providing services, particularly globally, you know, the idea of access, the idea of, you know, deletion rights, um, you know, informational rights, um, you know, we see sort of a mass expansion of those, particularly with respect to the GDPR, or the general data protection regulation that is in, in Europe, um, which is a very comprehensive privacy law that became enforceable in 18 and calls for a wide range of compliance obligations. So are there any challenges that you see with respect to, you know, managing sort of the increase in privacy laws, whether we're talking about GDPR or if we're talking about California's privacy law, which of course gets trumped a little bit by HIPAA, uh, and providing sort of these telehealth services? Yeah, yeah. So uh, in, in terms, Tidal is a global company, you know, we operate across the US, EU, Far East, Middle East, Australia, Africa, so we see pretty much everything. Uh, and obviously, apart from the regulatory, uh, medical device regulatory requirements that do, by the way, include cybersecurity aspects in them, including the FDA cybersecurity guidelines, uh, that you need to conform to these different medical device guidelines in different countries and different locations. 
Uh, you know, you have the CE in Europe, you have uh, FDA clearance in the US, you have others. Obviously on the privacy front uh, and, and these laws that the EU has just uh, released a, a few years back, uh, th these are very comprehensive privacy requirements uh, that require more attention and, and uh, you know, separate uh, handling uh, to them. And they're very comprehensive compared to some of uh, what's needed, for instance, in the US. And those require, uh, you know, uh, resources and some software changes and conforming to those uh, privacy needs of, of, uh, of those countries. There's also data requirements between different territories, by the way. Some territories require the data to be hosted on their territory, on their sand, essentially, you know, like the UK and Russia. So if you want to operate in those types of regions, you're going to need to store all of the data uh, that's acquired on their territory. And there are many other needs that relate to regulatory. It could be language localization, which could be part of regulation or the units, you know, the different metric, uh, you know, metric versus other units uh, that are used. So all of those factors together, you know, uh, need to be in place when you want to address those uh, needs. Thanks, Sophia. And I think just looking at keeping mindful of the clock here and with our last four minutes, we've got a few questions that have come from, from the audience here. And one I'm going to open up to all the panelists. Uh, this is in particular going on focusing on what, you know, smaller organizations uh, can do in terms of being prepared for cybersecurity data privacy. Uh, the question is this, do, do panel members have an outreach program to rural communities uh, for telehealth or for a mentoring track, for example, with, you know, for distance learning? And I, I don't know if, um, I don't know if you do, I thought I'd raise the question and then see if, um, you know, what may be out there. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure the context of the question, but related to school-based telemedicine and telehealth, we do, we have a professional product. We are installed in hundreds of school-based uh, telehealth programs. Many of them are in rural uh, areas. We work with smaller organizations that install these telehealth solutions and have nurses that are going to these uh, uh, schools and providing these uh, remote telehealth uh, services. I know that many health systems are also getting into this uh, now. So I don't know if that was the context of the question, but uh, that's what, uh, I can say. Yeah, and thanks, Sophia. I, I think uh, we've got two minutes left and, and we've got a number of questions that are coming from Q&A. Many of these are nuanced and I, I'm not sure we're gonna have time with them for time for them in the last two minutes of the call. I wonder though, if we might be able to, the panelists sort of end on a note and give your last, you know, any thoughts in terms of best practices to be thinking about from a cybersecurity standpoint as we move into the telehealth sector. And maybe you can do this in the context of, you know, one of the questions that was asked was, you know, there are six, you know, obviously significant cyber issues facing medical devices versus enterprise security. But I think even holistically, you know, uh, one or two points from your perspective uh, about how you can sort of protect, you know, what sort of your best practices are for, for data protection. And, and Paul, maybe I'll open this up to you to, to put us on a close mark here. Sure. Well, Ophir and Chris both made a bunch of great points. Um, uh, one thing that Chris said was that, you know, we've all, we're all in this together and you've got to look at this as a shared responsibility with all of your stakeholders. <clears throat> one other thing I just want to quickly tout is uh, the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council, which is a, a private and government kind of collaboration in, in healthcare cybersecurity just published a great document last month called um, Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity, Securing Telehealth and Telemedicine. And it really does an excellent job laying out the use of telehealth, the kind of risks that you face, um, best practices for managing those risks. And it's written at a level that um, you could go through it with a, a senior executive, an IT executive, um, a physician, uh, it's it's a really good guidebook and it's it just hot off the presses in the last month. So I just wanna tout that as well. That's great, Paul. And, and, and Chris, any 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 other uh, comments to sort of round things here? I, 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 the... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I want people to be aware, right? So the innovation that's taking place in the security industry is second to none right now. A lot of great companies coming out with a lot of great products. I think we're expected to see a growth in security spend across vertical globally about a trillion dollars by 2024.
But I want to bring something to everybody's attention is that we're seeing an increase in losses that are far eclipsing that number of $1 trillion across all industries, right? So I want people to stop for a moment and think for a second about how they're implementing their security programs to make sure that it's not about being small, about being large, having the greatest, best technology. It's about addressing your risk and understanding your operating environment first and foremost. What are you trying to achieve and accomplish? Build your security program for that first and foremost. And then secondly, don't give up. Fight the good fight. We need you out there. Society needs you to be on that front line to continue to drive equity with how we deliver healthcare to every citizen across the globe. So please don't give up. Fight that good fight. Thanks, Chris. And, and Ophir, we're just a bit over the time here, but maybe in 10 seconds or less, if you can give us your final points here on best practices. And for those in the audience who have asked, um, the, the article that uh, Paul was just mentioning, the health, se uh, healthsectorcouncil.org, securing health, telehealth is the link there. Okay, so Ophir, uh, take yeah, it Yeah, my, my feedback is there was a lot of great points raised here. Uh, and I think, you know, from the vendor perspective, if you're trying to build solutions for the telehealth space, I think you need to take consideration into the robust security programs we talked about and all of those security measures and standards. Uh, very important to be successful there. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time this hour after the lunch, and we hope everything that the panelists or the attendees found this to be very uh, informative. I certainly did. Uh, Chris, Paul, Ophir, thank you so much for your time uh, and talking about this very relevant uh, and very interesting topic. Uh, feel free, participants, to reach out should you have any questions. And with that, I will let everyone go and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank, thank you. you.